I have a question for uh, for for two of you at least mentioned the science fiction aspect of of ceramics, and I'm I'm kind of wondering if that's the um, also I think that like two of you, three of you, I think mentioned that, and and Anders, I think that in your work as well, I think the science fiction aspect, like in your house in Detroit, I think it was very clear. So. Uh, I would just like to 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 say some more about that. Uh, is that because of the strangeness to the body, or or the familiar, or the this thing that thinks is familiar and not familiar at the same time? Is it why? What is it with the clay and the science fiction? Could uh, somebody emphasize that? That work now and then? Yeah, oh it yeah, works. Maybe a bit, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess for me it's kind of a, a theme that I've been thinking about over a long period of time, and maybe I'm only just starting to kind of let that come out maybe more literally in the work itself. But um, I kind of feel like it happens on a lot of different levels, like the you know, I mentioned in the talk that for me there's kind of always this historic pairing of those two things as maybe as separate understandings as well as science and fiction, but coming together in ceramics. And then I think it also comes through maybe more as um, an idea, like you were talking about the kind of maybe unsettling or like combining something that's familiar and unfamiliar. And I think so often that happens in objects we're making maybe. Um. Any of you others would like to say something about that? I think I want to say um, I actually always wanted to be Sigury Weaver. And uh, uh, someone has mentioned that I look a little bit like her. <laughs> <laughs> cool. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen Alien? <laughs> the movies? Yeah. yeah. Well, I saw all those movies, and they made a great impact on me. And I think um, the unfamiliar, as you said, Lotta, is uh, very present in my work. And I think um, also the 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 fear, or <laughs> how to like visualize the fear. That's what I've been trying to work with a couple of times. And I think it's a great inspiration from those movies, actually. Uh, and the abstract form, the forms that we don't know, I can can uh, make um, that. Uh, it can uh, like give us these feelings. I think. Well, uh, does it work now? No. Well, uh, I think that uh, uh, when I saw the alien movies, I I was uh, thought that uh, people are afraid of. Uh, their inner self. I mean, like you're afraid of what you have inside that you don't understand. So it's like more like a lot of like you cannot make a horror movie about something which you don't know because we cannot comprehend what we don't know. So when you make science fiction movies like the Alien, it's like it looks to me like some kind of how do you say co contests? The the yeah, like in Volley, it looks mm -hmm. like something which is inside of you, like the 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 throat mm -hmm. or something yeah. like the alien monster. So uh, some kind of rib, some kind of it's like something. So when you're making psychological scary movies, like uh, uh, Jack Nicholson in in uh, in uh, the shiny, the shiny. You know, it's like this: I I the the familiar, the person next to you are, is going mad, but you don't understand him. So it's this this mm. thing, and also I think that uh, your material is is it's the same thing. It's like something very familiar you're talking about is something warm, something bodily, like close, and then what if it turns on you? And uh, kind of makes sense to me that this material you both control and you cannot control it. It's both, like Nina talked about, this thing that can be also be dangerous and turn against you or going into your house would be probably scary for a lot of people, depending on what kind of things they carry inside. If, if you turn it around and see it from the clay's perspective, it, 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 it becomes something else, I guess. 
What do you mean that clay will be naturally scared of people? Yeah, what we have done with it. <laughs> <laughs> in that way, we will have I think handled nature, it. And nature uh, in general is scared of people, perhaps, I think. Perhaps, yeah, but should but be, yeah. if, it's, if it's smart. Uh, is there any questions? Yeah. I, oh, oh, hello. Uh, I mean, one of the things we were talking a lot about in the, in the class over the last couple of weeks was this sort of, you know, the shift that we also live in. I think uh, our generation in some way, we, you know, we didn't necessarily kind of grow up with computers and social media and all that sort of stuff. And suddenly we are in a way kind of living the sci-fi world that we saw as kids. Um, this sort of idea that you can pick up a phone and you can see somebody else on the other side of the world. So, you know, one of the, the shifts that I think are happening is that we're beginning to live in these kind of fragmented and folded kind of realities. And so this sort of the idea of time as being continuous is becoming broken up more and more so because we have all of these breaks that are happening. And so um, I, I don't know, I think there's something that, that begins to kind of happen in the way that we perceive the world as well, that, you, that there is a kind of an openness to suddenly like the guts of somebody could come out because whatever, we were watching a television series for like 10 hours the, the day before, like whatever, binging on something, right? And it starts kind of messing with your head, I think, uh, mm -hmm. and, and, um, and starts kind of messing with your expectation of reality as well. And so there's this kind of merge between the fictional and the reality that is, that is beginning to happen. And I think uh, uh, possibly as a consequence, I've, I don't really think about science fiction relative to my own work, but I think um, this sort of shift from the, the, the many narratives that we, we take in as, as part of going through life and as being entertained, as socializing, as being part of other people's life, a lot of which, which is mediated now, I think, um, begins to kind of happen um, in, and, and comes through a lot of artistic practice as well. It's very interesting. I must say that it's been amazing, all your presentations. Uh, it's, uh, it's so interesting. And, and when I see you guys together, I think that this is kind of a historical mom uh, moment uh, in, a, in a Nordic uh, sense. So it's like we have this opportunity now to ask these questions that we won't have again. <laughs> you have to remember that. So my, one of my very basic, like as a, as, a, as a different kind of artist, uh, educated as a not within a specific media, uh, one of the things that fascinates me and has been fascinating me for since I started being interested in art is just, and it's probably a very dumb question, which is everybody can ask you a dumb question and it's always going to be interesting answers. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, it's these things between everyday, everyday objects and when it turns over into art, mm -hmm. uh, which is like when I look at uh, people doing craft in the way that you do or uh, every kind of line that we have in arts and craft department. I'm just so fascinated about what what does uh, the history of every uh, everyday objects and the history of art. What's what's the difference between you and, and does this mean anything? This when when the, uh, in your practice, because in within when I was educated at uh, Oslo Academy, it's this thing. Everybody is talking about reality. And I think that reality is very concrete when it comes to objects. And instead of talking it in sort of like this, like it's up there, it's like this thing. And, and suddenly uh, everybody uh, can sense, and uh, maybe it has to do with virtual uh, or with the digitalization, but suddenly you feel this need for the everyday objects. And then that's when does it does this shift and and has the idea of Duchamp like changed today because of that? I don't know if this sounds totally abstract, but there is something about the everyday object and and you doing this material thing and then it turns over to fine art. And I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about this very strange question. <coughs> I can say something now. So Listening to the other presentations, it seemed to me like several of us are interested in. Should I speak even closer to the mic? No, you just yeah. turn it. This is good. Yeah. No, Caroline, just do like this, and it's easier. Like this. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the, the what do we or several of us are looking for in the works we do is some kind of openness, or that the object that is for us a finished object still um, vibrates or 
keeps being a mystery to ourselves, even though it's finished. And I think the that can be achieved in many different ways, but it can also uh, use that uh, connection to the everyday object if you manage, like Anders does <coughs> in some of his objects, making sculptures that are very, very close to functional wear. That's one way of uh, um, building a question into the object itself. Yeah, makes sense. How do you think about that, uh, uh, Anders? Because because you did this when you're like putting objects, I making these objects that are close to reality, or close to an object that is usable into a house, and you're sort of it's something that happens, isn't it, between the actual house of the uh, interventions that you're making in 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 uh, in a real history, and then your objects come into. There is something that some kind of space between your objects and and the house, isn't it? Um, yeah, I, I think so. I mean, I I I've always hated the sort of um, separation between sort of the ideas of like the everyday and uh, the everyday object and the art object because I it it really it really kind of depends how you look upon it you know mm -hmm. I, d I think Kelly is probably much more qualified to answer this question really when it comes to it I mean in, in the sense of like uh, it's just a matter of how you choose to look at it I think and, and how you choose to contextualize it what I do in the installation is basically just using an, an, an apartment but I just I change over a, f a few of the ways that the materials appear uh, and and then suddenly it feels very different, but but most of what's in that that building is is um, is really what would be there otherwise. But I've just burned it, or I've done, you know, changed it over in some sort of way, or changed the, the material quality of the floor, or taken out a little bit of light from the no, windows. I was thinking about the first house, the at the oh the sign in yeah. house, yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. No, but today I just wanted it to be, you know, I mean, the question is then of like decorative arts, you know, yeah. is that you know is that an everyday object or is that fine art if you want to go with those categories because it's both, right? <laughs> and it always has been, and and so I think you can you can say with everyday objects too. I don't know how do you feel, Kel. I mean, I think you're much more into <laughs> that. And I, and I don't want to put you in the spot <laughs> either. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I don't know if I have any good uh, answers on that because I, I, I don't have to, I don't search for results in a meaning of that. I, I must understand what I, what I do. Usually it is the other way around that I, I want to come forward to something with with the material that in itself has some kind of history that can give another kind of value to to the to the work I do so, so it's connected and, and but then what I should say is that in the end I I don't want to I'm not searching for a kind of solution or, or uh, uh, it, it's a, it's a, how do you say? It's a, it's a kind of, <laughs> no, I, I, ja, men det handlar om att nå någon, alltså någon blandning mellan säkerhet och osäkerhet, att, att, att liksom, man ska inte veta vad det är på något sätt. Så <laughs> No, ma 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 ska fråga. You, you should ask what yeah. what can what can it what can it do? What is your how question? Can and I what can it do? How, how can I understand this? And 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 if I if I don't get it directly, then it it's something that I can can come back to. And I think that's. that's I think I think it has to do with yesterday. My uh, the <laughs> Alma that works with me. She showed me a book of which was just so amazing of the human body uh, uh, that they had made this uh, carvings of human. Uh, okay, it's a book that tells the story of the body, th how they have used it anatomically, but making sculptures and that uh, sculptures that you can open up and you can take off out all of the inside, like yeah, the heart and, and how that was made in the 16th century, 17th century and how it's 
today it's a sex doll. You know, the, the link be from that until the sex doll. So it's like this fake human body that you can, and, and the purpose is how it's changed. So it's something about this, it, be, it goes in and out of meta per perspective. And it doesn't, like you say, it doesn't really matter if it's art or not. I totally agree. When you go into Versailles, you think, oh my God, it's all so rotten. It's soon going to disappear, everything. And it's so expensive. So, uh, yeah. So it's something about this thing when things are, uh, and in, Nor in Norway, we have this word, word called Brukskunst. And and uh, uh, and it it's really no difference from an art. An object is an object. At, at the same time, it's something about culture that makes it different, or something in the way we talk about it. Uh, I I think there's some distinction, but it's not necessarily true. I mean, we're all making our culture all the time while we're we're going, aren't we? I mean, we're. Uh, it turns out that a friend of mine who works with 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 um, identity like uh, like research She's, she told me yesterday that it turns out this idea of identity is something that we changes we change all the time people are actually changing their their I perspective or perception of identity of themselves all the time like if i move to a different country i will change my identity very quickly it's not like it's it, you're stuck with it all your life so and i think that's a fascinating thought and i think that it's idea of art is changing all the time. Questions? Yeah, great. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot get, you have to come here. Moses has to come to. Violet? Hello. Uh, I have a question about technology and tools. Um, you were talking a little bit about it in your presentation on this, about a very old tools uh, that uh, was, was making mo modernity and um, but also in general working with clay as a very ancient material and working with ephemeral uh, the ephemeral um, but uh, how you look upon technology and tools in your practices Just use use those. Uh, yeah. Something, but yes, I I think oh, what you said about uh, modernity being uh, made by old techniques in a way, which is very true. And I think in our field, it's very important to realize that I was talking about throwing us some kind of obsolete uh, craft, uh, which I. I mean, it could be seen so, and if you look at it in economical terms, it's it's not very efficient. It's not a very efficient way to produce usable things, for example. But but all these old techniques, uh, you have the opportunity to to um, what do you say? You, it's up to you what comes out in a way. So I think that's why we keep the old techniques. Uh, in our field because they were useful if you want to express something uh, which may be not the most advanced technologies would be so they will be side by side i think in our field but i don't think uh, i think we will keep using uh, the obsolete techniques because they are so useful if you want to make meaning you could say and also maybe the technology of uh, understanding how something is made, uh, understanding how a kiln works or how uh, something, like your hands are digging into clay or, but then other technology like 3D printing or scanning or, or like, do you have any thoughts around, around technology in like a wider sense? I can say something short, but I think uh, it creates also, I mean, I think of myself as a person that's very interested in meaning, more interested in meaning than knowledge yeah. and, and uh, understanding, actually. Uh, so, so I think being in a craft, being close to a material, it creates a sense of meaning for you being in that process. And then the benefit is you could create meaning that goes 
out from the practice amidst the society. Um, and I think, at least for me, it's, it's not the same sensation sitting with the computer as sitting with a lump of clay asking me to do something with it, uh, actually. So, so it's more, mm, it's a more bodily experience and that's, that's a way to create meaning, I would say, for you and for the society, yeah. say something on that as well but uh, in some ways I feel like the in a practical way the way that I make things is very traditional and um, I don't use I guess part of the reason I like working with clay is because I I don't use many tools it's mostly just my hands and so there's that kind of very direct way of working which you know I kind of feel yeah, is really important to everything that I make. But then one of the things that I've noticed that's been a change um, since I started working the way that I do now with kind of ephemeral work, and um, that's maybe more to do with this idea of how I document it and um, I guess as well who's involved in that process. And when I initially started out generally... Um, I would photograph the work myself at that time. I think I'd only just got a digital camera as well. And so I'm kind of looking back at other artists, um, thinking about like Richard Long, the a line made by walking, where you have quite often with those sort of ephemeral works, there's like a single photograph that you remember each work by. And in the beginning, I think in some ways that was kind of how I was recording my work, but now, you know, every piece that I show then so if you look on Instagram or something then you've maybe got hundreds of images of the same piece by lots of different people that suddenly this process of documenting is kind of has kind of completely exploded and it's not really yeah something I'm even in control of which has kind of been I don't know something I'm thinking about I'm yeah still getting kind of trying to understand I think that's very interesting because I talked to a colleague of mine the other day, Vanessa Baird, and she did a, she did this talk in Bergen, and uh, she said she was uh, terrified because by the time she was out of the room, she realized that people had been posting her talking, and she's so nervous of talking in front of people, and then th th like people would film you now when you're talking, and b before you actually go out of the room, you are already talking about your work on net and other people are seeing you in a situation which she believes is like a dialogue with the people who is present at the moment and it becomes a totally different uh, talk uh, but also i was uh, i have to say when you're saying that that there are artists not anymore i guess but uh, you have artists like tchaikovsky or probably who was probably very inspired by brancusi uh, who had this brancusi you know had this film camera from man ray and he had like this, uh, uh, well, we can do a lecture on that once, nor your Brancusi, but w which we have to do actually. But uh, Brancusi uh, did his, um, he did all his filming himself. And the last 30 years, he allowed no one to take a picture of his things mm -hmm. except himself. So all the pictures that you see afterwards, they are like, look like generic and flat. And like, uh, th you can see that he didn't take the pictures. Mm -hmm. So it's this amazing because he would wait all day and because he never moved the sculpture the last 30 years of his life. Of course, this has to do with money. Because if you did that today, locked your studio door and say, I'm go not going to talk with people for the next 30 years and nobody's going to move a sculpture, you're not going to sell anything. And, uh, and so uh, afterwards, that's the image that, uh, images because he's controlling it even after his death. But the French state, of course, demolished the whole thing like the second he was di uh, dead yeah. so I, I mean but it's very interesting that thing that ho how can you control the imagery of what you're doing and does it like Walter Benjamin would say take it away the aura of your work I, I don't know more questions uh, do you have anything else you would like to add before we and the day. So I have a question for Phoebe. <laughs> so I was really curious. You mentioned at some point that you were trying to, in the in the way of like recreating your works, you were you mentioned at some point that you were trying to record the humidity of the room. 
in some sort of way as, as being part of an archive or something like that? Could you just elaborate on that? It just sounds like really kind of fascinating. Yeah, I guess um, maybe not record it necessarily, but like re recreate. reproduce it, yeah. So I guess what I'm currently thinking of doing is the work that I made in Leeds that was one of like the enclosed in polythene so that perhaps I might try and produce a text that kind of describes that piece somehow, but then um, you, would, uh, you would read that within a kind of very similar environment, so perhaps within the polythene and the, um, you know, that same humidity, so still I'm not sure exactly yet how I will reproduce that, but um, yeah, I'm kind of interested in how you might kind of pair that sensory like non-visual sensory experience of the original work and the kind of imagined description you get from reading mm -hmm. um but yeah i guess it's something i feel like i need to try out and i don't know maybe it's pointless <laughs> i don't know but i kind of feel i need to to go through that because it's uh, yeah something i'm you know i guess i'm trying to work out of what you what you can still access without the actual object, maybe. So, uh, yeah. It's another question for Phoebe, that you were, you were talking about clay, uh, using clay uh, for, um, in, uh, with r radioactive waste um, in some way. I just remember that part and I wrote it down and I think it's very interesting. And uh, I know um, they've been used uh, bentonite to seal um, craft at, at uh, atomic, yes, nu nuclear waste. Um, and if it's uh, like a similar thing and um, yeah. Yeah, so I guess, um, yeah, it was when I was at Camden Art Centre and uh, I kind of went to interview people in the department of um, Imperial College in London. Um, so it's the, yeah, they're kind of all material scientists, but the within ceramics, the kind of main focus was on radioactive waste management, and that was partly through designing ceramic structures that could kind of deal with that, but also in certain other circumstances, it was more using the clay as a raw material itself. So like there's um, a site in France where they kind of bury the waste within the ground that obviously is clay. And because of the, um, I guess the natural properties of clay, it kind of seals in the waste and sinks as well because um, the waste is heavier. So it kind of, I guess using the natural properties to kind of deal with, for me what was interesting was, um, I guess radioactive waste, it's kind of this impossible material and that was kind of really fascinating for me just to kind of try and mm. understand something about how, yeah, it was interesting that clay and ceramics could provide answers to dealing with that impossibility. I'm going to end uh, today's uh, seminar. No, is there a question? Who, who is? Oh, that's going to be hard. Can you come down, please? Very big head or ask her. Yes, I can shout. Hmm. Um, I was wondering, because you, have been, um, you were going to tell us what questions you had in your practice, uh, and I'm, to, I'm trying to figure out, do you have anything, what do you have in common as ceramics? Do the material in itself make you that is it a fam familiarity in your practice or the questions you ask because of the material that you use? Uh, some of you have been mentioning that you're between the contrasts or looking into the hybrids or and you talk about science fiction, but, but do you have any comments to that? Do you feel does the material that you work with make a familiarity in your practice concerning what questions you ask? Or It's always a relevant question, asking a question. <laughs> I can say something. I um, Well, I had a wish for this seminar, and 
It was that um, by inviting people to present their own practice and their own questions, we would see that there are multiple reasons and very diverse uh, <laughs> reasons for choosing to work with clay and ceramics. Um, some do it because of the properties of clay they are drawn to, how it feels to handle plastic clay. Some of us do it because of the history of the material or uh, the science around it. Um, some of us do it because of the possibility to tell stories, to make narratives. But um, I'm thinking that, and also listening to the talks today, that something that seems to be common still is that we do take, um, incl include the material as a partner in the process. There is some kind of dialogue with the with clay or with the material we handle as a raw material. And I don't know if that could be uh, be something that we still have in, in common. Even though I think uh, Morten said that he doesn't really, you, you, would not, you were not gonna talk about having a dialogue with the material, but I think that we can still conclude that you do. Yes, of course. 